Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast presented by Spartan Forge. On today's episode, I am joined by Troy Pottinger out of Idaho. So Troy has been on the podcast many times over the years, but this one is special as we break down his 2022 season in Idaho and Washington, hunting some truly next level mountain bucks. We discuss his hunting rig set up for the mountains, why a particular cluster of community scrapes are so good patterning bucks on scrapes closing the deal on a public land booner in washington different methods for getting your deer out of the woods and there's a lot more in this episode it's a a longer episode than usual but uh, a lot of good information there on this week's mountain buck monday story of the week we have a story coming from daniel hutchison out of virginia Daniel says, I wanted to reach out and tell you how much I've enjoyed your podcast over the last couple of years. I feel like I've gained so much knowledge and drive from the mountains of Southwestern Virginia. I began my public land journey about three years ago. The respect and admiration that I now have for mountain bucks are unreal and it's ignited a passion inside me that I didn't know was there. Anyways, the reason for my message was to say how much I enjoyed your last episode with Zach Farrenbaugh. On October 15th, I decided to go in and scout slash still hunt a piece of public that I've been map scouting. The place is incredibly difficult to access and therefore doesn't have as much pressure. Midday while working around a bench, I noticed a group of deer working towards me. Sitting down and letting them work by me proved to be the best choice I could have made. A few minutes later, I noticed a nice buck following their trail. I ended up making a great shot on him. He only ran about 100 yards. And once I walked up to him, I couldn't believe his mass. My first Pope and Young buck and to do it on public ground in the mountains was a feeling I'd never experienced. Just wanted to say thanks and good luck to you this season. So thanks for sending that in, Daniel. I mean, this buck is a freaking tank. seems like all these bucks that are being sent in are just awesome deer, but uh, awesome buck coming out of the mountains of Virginia. And, And if anybody has been to Virginia, they have some big mountains, it's steep, it's rugged, it's hard to get into some of these spots, so definitely well earned. Head over to East Meets West Hunt on Instagram and East Meets West Outdoors on Facebook to check out the photo uh, as you or photos as you can every week when I put up the Mountain Buck Monday post. So go over and check those out and feel free to send in your submissions. I love uh, getting these stories. The best way to send them in though is not through social media, it's through email. Bo at East meets West hunt.com, uh, or just fill out the contact form on my website. Social media messages are hard to keep up with, but email, I can keep track of them, put them in a folder and I'm able to, to, to find them there. But thanks for sending those in. Uh, lastly, before we jump into this episode, mountain buck scouting camp registration goes live this Wednesday, January 11th, 2023 at 7 PM Eastern time for the camp that will be April 15th and 16th. So we just finalized all the costs for that. So costs will be $575 for general admission and $1,075 for the VIP option. I have a link in the podcast notes where you can go uh, to register on that date and has all the information on what the two different packages are, what's included in them, and you know, kind of what the value is uh, from you know, putting the money towards doing this camp. There's a lot there's a lot more that's coming this year than even last year based off of feedback from the guests uh, or guests excuse me uh, the attendees that were there and just internally kind of putting things together to try to continually approve, to improve it. There'll be a lot more gear that's given away uh, this year. I mean, just a ton of stuff going on. I don't even have all of the the giveaway stuff and partners and stuff yet on the, on the websites. I'm still working through some of the deals there, but trying to get as much value as possible into this. And I, I think you'll, you'll truly walk away with this no matter what level of experience that you have with a lot more information to to be able to go forward, especially with having those like Johnny Stewart, my dad and, and Greg Litzinger and Ryan Glitzke and Kenny Kane and Bill Thompson and and everybody else that's going to be there with different backgrounds and everything and different styles of hunting and being able to share their experiences and then show it to you in, 
in the mountains there and show you sign and, and be able to go through that. So really excited for that. But uh, last year, again, it sold out in less than two minutes. So if you want a spot, I would recommend getting on there Wednesday, January 11th at 7 p.m. Eastern time and trying to get your spot right away. And lastly, I am currently in Ohio with Johnny Stewart during their muzzleloader season for a couple of days, uh, hoping to find a nice mountain buck or maybe even a doe. Not really sure yet, but uh, it'll be fun to get out either way. It's This was not a planned trip. It's kind of a last minute thing. I was like, I just, uh, Johnny brought it up to me on New Year's Eve and I was like, hey, why not? Let, might as well give it a shot and head to Ohio and and have some fun with the inline muzzleloader. So, all right. Well, I hope everyone has a great rest of your week and really enjoys this podcast with Troy Pottinger. Cool. Troy Pottinger, welcome back to the podcast. It, uh, it really hasn't been that long since we, uh, since we last talked. It was in the, in the summertime, but uh, I'm, I'm excited to have you back on again. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Bo. I, I thought we didn't talk in, uh, we didn't talk during the season at all, huh? Summer? No. No, it was uh July time frame, I believe, that that we did a podcast and then um during the season you and I texted back and forth, it seemed like uh weekly, but uh we we didn't uh do any podcast during the fall. Gotcha. Gotcha. How was how was your season? It was good. It was uh it was a tough it was a tough season. Uh it was in in PA we had some really unseasonably warm weather and uh it was it was tough, but I ended up filling my tag November fourth on a uh, nice eight point beautiful uh, mountain buck probably he's here four or five years old i don't have a ton of history with him but i I do have uh, some family members who had him on camera about four miles away from where i killed him at uh so he was on a little rut uh he was on his own rutcation he was taking off looking for some does and and i caught him the last evening i had to hunt before i went to alberta it was 72 degrees and was in one of my kind of creek bottom spots. That was a big community scrape that's been there for 15 years, kind of in a, in a, just in a bottom where there's a bunch of funnels of uh, uh, little val- little drainages and valleys that kind of made like a hub there in that bottom. And he came up and I actually called him in and he came running right in the 12 yards and was able to was able to put an arrow through him and and he uh he dropped out of sight but he was only he only went 30 yards and piled up so i couldn't ask for much much more from that yeah i remember seeing him on instagram i remember seeing the pictures do you are you guys just a one buck buck state Bo? yeah yep we're uh we're just a one buck state so then after that i i went down to west virginia but i ended up getting sick and uh i am well, I guess it was, yeah, I went to Alberta, then went to West Virginia and, and down there I was on some really good deer and ended up passing, uh, great, what would normally be a great deer for me, but I was looking for a really old big deer down there. And, uh, those, those mountains in, uh, in Southern West Virginia is just there. They can grow some, some incredible deer and just real steep, rugged country in the coal mines. And, uh, nice. Yeah, so I spent four days down there, which isn't a whole lot of time, and I was hoping to get back down in December, and then just never, never made it back down. So um, I'm gonna get back down there in February and do some shed hunting and some scouting, and just plan it out for for the next year. So learned a lot my second season hunting down there. But how was how was your season going, Troy? Good, good. It just limited time with ties football and making sure I tried to kill one of my two best target bucks between Idaho and Washington got one killed. So it was really good, you know, cause two bucks are hunting are both bucks of a lifetime for anybody with a bow and arrow in this country. So actually yeah. they're, buck of life, they're buck of a lifetime for anybody with a rifle. So I was very happy to get one of the two killed. And I actually worked really hard on the other buck, probably more, probably more so early, way more so early than the buck that I ended up killing. Um, but no, anytime you can kill your top buck for a state and especially the caliber of buck I'm after, I'm pretty darn happy. Yeah. Pretty stoked. <laughs> I would say so. And, and it's funny because I remember when we talked in the summer, you were talking about how you had limited time in with, with Tyson playing football and you going to all the games and stuff like that. And then obviously with your, uh, job being a teacher, like you don't, 
the, you don't have a whole lot of time. Weekends are kind of where you have the uh, availability. And then with football games, yeah. that made made that obviously tougher for you. Yeah, I just have to be. I just have to be really calculated and and play my cards right all the time to have a chance. Especially trying to run down one of these giants, you know, it's it's hard enough to find one, let alone have him killable. <laughs> and, and you know, fifty percent this year on a my top two deer, one top top number one deer for each state, but fifty percent the. The other big deer was new to me, new country. You know, it's kind of like you go into it, like you talk about going to a new area. Anytime you dive into brand new country, it's a big, it's a big education that first year, just how everything plays out in that environment in that area and how the other hunters hunt it, how all the rifle affects it, how all the elk hunting affects it. And yeah, it was, it was a great educational year for me on one buck i learned a lot i think he's in trouble early season next year Bo, sorry my <laughs> dog Bo. Uh, the other bow <laughs> this is my pup here he's he's wanting to go get out in the woods but anyway no it's just really educational for me learning a brand new area on a tremendous deer that was able to find just by prospecting um uh, all over in the summer in a good area and then uh, jumping back into a different buck in his playing field because he he was really he got really killable mid or mid November on, so I just had to play my cards right and play the one that was most killable and ended up killing the one that was definitely I was in the game with the other buck I got out of the game with in uh, November because the snow here this year has been crazy we had so much snow that. It pretty much moved all those deer. Uh, that first buck I was after, it moved him, I'm sure. It's a migrational area for deer if they get too much snow. So, um, yeah, I actually, I actually spent this last week, you know, just trying to think of where I might be able to find him with all the snow. And there's really, there's just too much snow everywhere. I have no idea where this deer is now. Huh. In, yeah. it's, it's actually funny before, before we started recording, uh, we, we were going through a whole bunch of things with <laughs> at Troy's house where he was, his neighbor is actually stuck outside because there's so much snow and the, the dogs were barking and, and it sounds, yeah. it sounds like it just been a, a pretty, uh, pretty miserable year from the snowfall standpoint. And, and obviously like, so anybody that's listening, if you haven't listened to the other ones I've done with Troy, uh, in the past, you know, he's talked a lot about, how snow impacts these deer, you know, as far as they migrate during the winter, um, out of some of that higher country and, you know, even where you're finding sheds and all that different stuff depends on when, you know, when the snowfall pushes, pushes them out. Now I'm assuming this year is going to be difficult for you finding sheds because they're not going to be in their normal spots. Cause didn't you say before, like a lot of your big deer drop in January and they typically don't migrate until after that. Yeah, it will all depend on the elevation that any said deer was living at. So let's take the two deer that I hunted this year, the top two, one for each state, uh, Washington, Idaho. I live close to the border, so I hunt both states. The reason I was in the game with the eastern Washington buck over the Idaho buck is the Idaho buck lived at about 5,000 feet early season. And up to 5,000 feet, you know, he, he moved around, but I know he worked his way up into the 5,000 foot range, just based on where I was. The Washington buck had a max range of 3,500, 4,000 feet. So because of all the snow that we got, we probably got about three feet at my place. Now it's settled big time and it, now it's raining on it today is why it's such a mess. And it's settled huge down low at my 2,800 foot elevation home. But as soon as you get up into the higher country, it's colder. The snow doesn't settle quite as fast. Instead of getting rain on top of it, it's getting snowed on. So yeah, uh, depending on where the given target of mine was living made a big difference in my ability to hunt him this year because of all the early snow, Bo. And my house is at 2,800 feet. 
And if I had over three feet of snow already, and yes, it's settled way down, but I've had over three feet, uh, that definitely moved that 5,000 foot elevation type deer range that moved those deer. And that's what I ran into with, with my Idaho target. So I bounced to my lower elevation target area and got on the buck that's sitting here beside me. And I had, I was in the game with him because he moved down right to me. Um, I was able to get to him barely. And now I'm talking about between vehicle travel and foot travel. I think my, I think the trail that I had pounded in to the tree stand that I was hunting him on a big scrape, big scrape cluster. Um, there was at least spots with 18 inches of trail pounded down in the snow. And there was spots in there, two foot of snow standing. So I had to stay on it to even get to the tree stand. And I did. And likewise with my vehicle, um, I'm set up to get into places. A lot of guys aren't. So I was able to get in and park my rig in a decent proximity to where I could actually hunt the deer. If I wasn't set up right with my vehicle, I'd have never hunted this deer. Yeah, no, that, uh, yeah, that, I, you, what well, you have, um, you have a big Dodge that you run, don't you? Is that what you run up in the mountains too? Yeah, that's one of them. I've got a couple rigs that are set up for my hunting and I use them strategically based on how many highway miles I got to travel, how deep the snow is. And this particular spot, I use the Cummins because I've got it on 37s. Uh, I've got it on a four inch lift. I can just crawl into places that most guys can't. And I trust me, those big, heavy, those big, heavy uh, rigs actually get around great. Uh, as long as you got a solid base, you know, underneath the snow. Yeah. Because they're, they're so heavy. So they just, you know, I can crawl up into places that most people wouldn't think you could get a full size truck, but I have it set up right for it. So, yeah, I was able to pound a trail. Um, I didn't use my other rigs much in there just because that, that truck is set up so good for the deepest snow. Uh, two feet of snow is nothing for it. I can, I can walk right up through two feet of snow. And of course, tires are everything. Yep. And I purposely put on, I always put my brand new set of tires on every two years uh, for this kind of hunting. I always put them on right at the end of October, every, every t I time it every time, right at the end of October, right when I'm going to get all my snow in the high country, I always put my brand new tires on every two years and I only run a set for two years. So they actually have a lot of tread left on them. When I get, when I pull them off, you know, they're probably 40%. 50, 30%, 40% still, but it doesn't work for me if I don't exchange tires every two years. Yeah. What, what tires are you running for the, for the snow there? I, I run a, and I've done it for years. I, I don't run any type of AT all terrain at all. They pack with snow and they turn into ice balls way too fast. So I run a true mud tire, a big MT that has a lot of space in between the lugs. And then I sipe them real heavy. And when you do that, you have all the space in between the lugs, like that much gap, and it'll spit all the snow out and clean out and stay clean. And then I sipe the heck out of them, which helps you on the ice. And that's what works best for me in the mountains. We're talking some of my spots are 20, 25 miles in. Huh. And then That's, I, and then I chain up, oh, I need to, then I chain up. I was up. just going to ask that. I was going to say, I feel like in those situations, yeah, having a, a good set of chains is, is a, a no brainer. Cause like I actually need a new set for my truck. Cause I always carry a set with me, uh, anywhere I, I go, especially as we're getting in the late season here and you start getting snow and ice and stuff on some of the roads. And, and, uh, but I realized I, I sized up my tire a little bit. My chains don't fit anymore when I was putting them in yeah. way before we got some snow. And I was like, I need to get, get, need to get a new set of chains for it. Yeah. And I have snowmobiles. Uh, if the last thing I want to do is get stuck in the back country in my truck, it's a lot to dig out. So when it gets yeah. too deep, when it gets too deep, you have to, I mean, there was, there was guys this year in my country that were hunting off of sleds is the only way they could get in. So yeah, I'll switch over to a snowmobile if I have to. Um, 
this buck I did not have to chain up on. And the reason the buck I killed, the reason I didn't have to chain up on Bo is I kept my trail pounded out. Even when I, like a couple times I drove the, the long drive and just drove the trail in at 10 o'clock, eight or nine, 10 o'clock at night, just so I could get in two days later. If that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I just pounded my road out. So I knew I, cause I, I was watching all these snowstorms coming and I knew if I didn't pound the road down, you know, if I didn't pound the six or eight inches of fresh down, I knew I wasn't gonna be able to hunt the deer two or three days later when I wanted to hunt him or could hunt him or had opportunity to basically had a day I could. So I stayed ahead of that really good. And that's something that I don't think a lot of people think about. And I got all kinds of texts this year, this year from guys that would say, man, I just can't hunt. I can't even get in. I have no, you know, the snow's got me, but I try to do everything I can to be proactive to have a chance. And that's what I did. I, I drove a lot of miles just to keep my road open. Even on days I didn't hunt, I had to do it yeah. at dark after dark, you know, late at night to get there because I was working or I was coming home from a football game or whatever. You know, I was, I just made sure I did it. Yeah. And that's not something like you said that, you know, something not a lot of people think about, but even, I think even if people do think about it, they're just not willing to do it. Like that takes a lot of effort. That takes a lot of money. That takes a lot of time, uh, to be able to, to yeah. go in and, and pack that down and clear it out. And, and I've always been amazed at, you know, the distances that you're driving, you know, again, you know, working all day and then driving, like, I don't know, you were telling me before about, you know, you'll, you'll drive a couple hours to hunt for an hour. If you, if you have to, if it's the right conditions. That's all I was doing on this deer was drive an hour and a half hour, hour to an hour and a half from work to hunting for an hour, hour and a half. I mean, realistically it was about an hour and a half of seat time because you got, you know, you got to get there. You got to get out. You got to, you got to throw some clothes on quick. Uh, I, I always spray down with bandishing hunter. I make my, I always do that. Um, so that takes two minutes. Uh, you know how it is. And then you got to hike in, then you got to hike in. So yeah, I was, I was probably getting an hour and a half of actual speed time to hunt this deer on the days that I worked. And then, um, I was very picky and very, I really was watching the wind and really watching his tendencies and how he was behaving to pick my days. And what I ended up doing is, is seeing him and having him broadside one day on one of those hour and a half sets. I mean, it was money. It, it worked out good. Bo, lay down. Hey, Bobo, you need to lay down. Sorry, Bo. Just a sec. You're my good. dog's name, my dog, for the viewers, my dog is named Bobo. So come here, Bo. <laughs> Bo, lay down. It's actually Bo Cephas, but we call him Bo. Lay down. Lay down. I wish my full name was Bo Cephas. That would be, <laughs> I, I wish that I would have been named that. <laughs> I do tell people that as a joke. They're like, what's Bo short for? I'm like, Bo Cephas? I'm like, really? No. <laughs> I wish. Our dogs are our dogs are father and son. And <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> he doesn't get far from me. That's, that's Hank. Hank. That's that's daddy. <laughs> Yeah. And then Bo. Yep. There's Bo. And they don't get, he, do, these dogs don't get far from me, but it's father and son. So we went with Hank and Bo Cephas. Anyway, yes. I apologize for saying your name over and over when it's my, it's when it's my big lab. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, and that's fine. They're, uh, they're chomping at the bit to go shed hunting really bad, but no, back to that buck. Uh, the days, my days were definitely had to be cho chosen wisely. And I, I started just feeling like I was going to get him killed based on last year's Intel the year before he was a young guy. He didn't do much, but last year he gave us a ton of Intel and we left him alone because he broke his rack off. He broke it off right after the eye guard. So we, we dubbed him half rack last year, but he was just a really aggressive, uh, scrape tender the the dude last year was in the mix of being probably the baddest dude on the hillside and then this year he definitely was so i guess my point is he he would really tend to my scrapes and overmark them 
And each time that I hunted him, which really wasn't a lot, we could get to that. It really wasn't many hours when you add it all up. But on the, on that first or second short shift sit, sorry, first or second short sit that I went in to kill him and I thought I was going to kill him. I saw him at 54 yards, dog and a doe. He stopped broadside for me. I could have took the shot. I elected not to shoot him that far. Wide open broadside on the hillside above me. And it's a steep, it's a real steep face bow that kind of benches out. And I'm sitting on the low side of the bench. Yep. And I'm doing that because of the thermals in my entrance and exit. And it's a, it's a money spot. I killed a 162 in there four or five years ago. Game scrapes. And I've had multiple good bucks in there. And Tyson's really good encounters in there himself. Uh, Ty did remind me that years ago, I shot one in the brisket and made a, not a, it just clipped him and he lived. But Ty reminded me of that the other day. Dad, you missed brisket in there too. We call, called the buck brisket after that. <laughs> um, but I forgot about that. I was like, dang, I, th- I was like, I thought you missed that there. And he goes, no dad, that was you. <laughs> that was year. That was years ago. But the whole point is this scrape, this scrape cluster is incredible. It's awesome. Um, found it over a decade ago or right out a decade ago. And it's just one of those very, uh, rare finds where, multiple big hub community scrapes are all clustered together at about 20 foot circle, if you will. And they're all kind of around a patch of different ocean spray. And every deer in the area knows where they're at and they check them and the bucks are the amount of buck to doe ratio. I get in there is crazy during late October, all the way to December 10th. As far as like, it's a, it's a good buck to doe ratio, like as far as more bucks coming through or the opposite. Five to five bucks to one doe. Easy. Oh, geez. And it's because (laughs) of it's in my opinion, it's because of there's always three to five doe family groups that address those scrapes. And the bucks know it's more than one doe family group. So bucks come from a long range to check it i'll get bucks that i'll get bucks that live fairly close on purpose and and basically make their bedding area there fairly close on purpose but i also get bucks that come from you know places that guys have them over a mile two miles away so that that it's a big draw um meaning it's a big pull for for multiple bucks it terrain based it's excellent the terrain the the security cover up in there the little ridges that lead all around and down to it just where it lays is great for horizontal travel during the rut because it's far enough up into the cover that it gets them away from the traditional hunting pressure Um, it's a hike it's all uphill Uh, So I'm playing against, you know, that obstacle as far as trying not to sweat and smell bad and all that stuff. But no, it's, it's just a really cool spot. And we've had, when you say, uh, when you were talking about the, the, the train, as far as good for horizontal travel and everything. So kind of explain what, what that looks like exactly. Like as far as it, um, you know, like where a bunch of ridges kind of dump down to, are they finger off from there or is it kind of like in a bowl or what's it, what's it kind of look like? I think it's great for horizontal travel based on my observations of all the trails in there. I mean, it, there's vertical travel too, but horizontal travel is great there because everything right beyond my stand goes like this bow straight up and it's very steep. So I'm down on that elevation line to where it just starts to it comes down and it just starts to level a little bit and if you think about it the whitetails can get right below that real steep ground all the way around the mountain and they can hit more favorable travel ground with great trails on it where all the does want to live anyway so you get a lot of at this stand you get a lot of east west travel okay and that's horizontal to the mountain Yep. Uh, and to the ridges. So I've got these vertical ridges. I've got these vertical ridges that all feed down to me. 
to warm on where my so-called bench is. It's kind of a pseudo bench, half bench. And then I've got ridges beyond me, Bo, right below, right behind my back where I'm sitting that drop off even more. So I've got these draws where the thermals just pull down off of it. Mm, and we okay. get a lot of, we get a lot of South winds across this and we get a lot of Southwest winds and we get a lot of, I mean, we get every kind of wind in here and the deer come from every direction, but the horizontal travel is so good because there's reprieve there. There's, it's not so damn steep. You know what I mean? Yep. And the bucks can travel it all day long. And that uphill thermal, they can be right above it or just below it. And they pick up all of the doe bedding scent. And they can do that around the mountain and the mountain's big, but they can do that around this mountain for, for miles. And then in the evening, they can come down and pick up all that downhill thermal after dark and run around after dark down low and feel safer and get down even closer to humans in the dark. So I'm positioned up in there where I get the daylight, a lot of horizontal travel in the daylight. Yep. I don't know if that made any sense at all, but I tried to explain it. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm following you there. And, and so, uh, the, the other thing that I kind of wanted to go back to, well, actually one thing that you said, I just kind of want to reiterate is you're talking about being on the edge. So like the edge of that somewhat bench as you go up because of, you know, the thermals being able to dump down over is probably, especially when, when there's any shade or cloud cover or evenings or whatever, that's, that's pulling it down over. Is that correct? Like, so you're, you're on that edge there and, and are you set up for like the wind that if it would come across that bench kind of coming and then towards that drop off or, or is it, is it so steep in there or is it yeah so steep in there that you're not really having a whole lot of predominant winds that are affecting it? So it's not the, the predominant wind still affected and it, okay. it is fairly steep. It's fairly steep beyond me. If that yep. makes sense. Yep. To my backside, I'm set up in a tree. I mean, it's just unbelievable spot that we chose years ago that I chose the tree I chose. That's why I won't move it. Um, I've got right beyond me. If I'm sitting in my stand right here, right beyond me on both sides, I have a draw. I'm on a little tiny flat bench that fingers into a point and I'm sitting right on the backside of that, right on the backside edge of that. So uh. if my wind drops off here or here beyond me, which it happens all the time, even with certain predominant winds, and it makes like an X with north and south winds in there for me. So I get a lot of cross winds for the deer, which are good for the deer. They'll travel in them. And then it's Xing off of me, Bo, and down those two draws. Huh. Okay. I mean, yeah, that's that's like a bulletproof <laughs> spot there. Like, and, and we talked about that the last time we were on was like how you spend so much time at these locations. Like, say if you were just finding that those scrapes for the first time, like you'll spend an hour or two sometimes just, you know, dropping milkweed or whatever, kind of figuring out how things go and trying to find that right tree to be in there. Cause I'm assuming, you know, with the way that you're explaining it, you could be a couple trees over and could be completely out of the game where they're going to, where exactly. they're going to catch up. Exactly. This place is incredible because the first, first time I ever packed tree stands up in there, we packed two for Ty and I, when he was younger and I wanted him to sit with me there. Cause I knew, I just knew it was going to produce with, I mean, I hadn't even ran a camera on it yet, but the, when we found those scrapes in the shed season 10 years ago, we're talking in the spring, they had tracks all over in them, everywhere. And I could see how, even with the pine needles and stuff laying in them, I could see how dug up and how hammered they were. And then the licking branches were just obliterated for decades, you could tell. So when we first packed, am I, am I, talking, am I too loud, Bo? No, you're, the you're talking good. No, you're talking okay. perfect. Sounds good. Okay, I apologize. I was thinking, man, maybe I'm talking too loud in here. I got the the furnace is on behind me. Anyway, um, when we packed stands into this spot, Bo, to speak to your point, I think I spent two hours, roughly. And, th and this is the stuff when your son's growing up with you and he's young and he's with you. I, I 
I don't think Ty ever said a word about it, but we talk about it. But I'll bet he was thinking, what the hell are you doing, Dad? Why are you taking so long? You know, I, I wonder if he thought that when he was younger, because I would yep. I would just back and forth. And I've always been a guy that I just feel the wind off my face. And I just have been in the, I don't know, I, I don't always pack milkweed with me. It's great. But I can usually just go into a spot and sit and concentrate and meditate a little bit on it and just feel what the wind's doing. And then in my mind, think about the thermals, think about the morning, the evening, how the pole's going to be, how the, you know, the south, southwest winds are going to hit it. We get a lot of those. How the north and the east winds are going to hit it late season, which I always take into consideration because I get a lot of those. The tree that I chose had great cover, two big trees around me. I knew I had to go real high because I'm on the low side of that partial bench but i wanted all of my scent to dump off behind me in those two draws and i knew i was going to come up the uh, southern draw to get there the draw to the south uh east of me no south of me actually but i also knew or i felt that when i set those stands years ago that if i put them in this particular tree and if i went high enough i would literally get the deer to walk right under me and based on where the thermals in the majority of wind directions would dump as an X across me and behind me, the only wind I didn't want to ever hunt it in was a straight southeast or an east. I can actually hunt it with an east. It's not bad. I mean, it's not horrible, but a southeast is the worst. And southeast is my least, uh, you know, that's the wind I get the least. Yeah. Is southeast. So it just always made sense. And Tyson and I were talking about it the other day and talking about all these bucks that we've killed and had encounters with in there over the years. I mean, it's it's been exactly what we thought it was. And cool. yeah, and the thing is, I don't want to move around in there. I don't want to disturb it. So those stands get checked in the summer and new straps have been put on them and whatnot, but it's a very low intrusive place that the deer just come to me. Yeah. It's bad. Well, you know, it's incredible. Well, you know, Troy, it's like one of the things that you said there, uh, about, you know, that historical wind and what you know for those areas, that's so important when you're looking at your setups. And one of the things that, that, that I do before I go into a new area or even areas that I've been in before, I, I always, like, so, uh, within the, the Spartan Forge app, there's a Intel tab that has something where it has historical weather and you can go to historical wind and look at by zip code, you can go and look at the different months and it'll show you kind of on a graph where the most wind directions are coming from because each area is a little different depending on where you're at in the country. Even, even in the state, sometimes it's a little bit different what you're getting more of. And if you're planning on hunting something in October, that's going to look like different winds than it is in December or even, even November as you go through. And it's important to look at that, especially if you're setting up uh, or prepping a tree or, or setting up a stand in a place that that you plan on hunting for a specific time like it sounds like this this area um, with with those scrapes and the way that they use it and come through there, all those doe group groups that's a, definitely a, a rut spot like that's probably where you when you hunt it the most if I'm if I'm thinking correctly yeah it's interesting this spot gets I get velvet bucks in there that are great some years really um, but but yeah um, you know, I was talking to Aaron the other day on the fall podcast about it and I'm in the bedding. I am in with the does and I'm right. You know, I've talked about it in the old days a lot. I probably haven't brought it up in a long time, but I always draw circles on maps of where all my does bed and where I find sheds and where I backtrack. And, you know, that's something I did on this buck too. Please ask me about that. But when I get snow, I backtrack my bucks for at least 50 to 100 yards off my stand when I feel it's safe, just to get the general direction that they're coming from and wanting to enter and exit. So over the years, and even currently, this has been one of those spots, Bo, where you can draw circles of four or five doe family groups live here, and it overlaps us where bucks bed above them. And all of my, the majority of my 
stud buck travel, big deer, mature deer travel came from just above me. But there's a reason why it does. The reason why I'm set up in there and the reason why those scrapes are so good in the daylight and the reason why the deer have used them for decades and decades is because the security covers there, the bedding is just above it and the bedding's huge. There's, there's, I don't know, 500 acres of bedding above me and around me. Like if you did a big swath on yep. a map, there's, there's probably 500 acres of bedding max or minimum, sorry, minimum. It's a big area. So do I, do I worry about like specifically where the buck I'm trying to kill is laying down for the day? No, I know that I can set up at this spot. I know that he's not far from me based on all the evidence that I get. But I also know I have four or five doe family groups right around me. Now, the hard part's getting in there and not screwing that up. Yeah, no, and and uh, that that you, your visual that you just gave me there with like drawing the circles and the overlapping that's that's such a good that's such a good thing for for anybody that's listening. It doesn't matter where you're at in the country to yep. to do to do that because like even when you mark waypoints of say you find doves and and stuff in there when you look at a map it's kind of hard to to understand how it works but literally either printing it out and physically you know drawing a circle on there that just gives yep. you a different way of looking at it um especially when you're looking at stuff that has terrain and you can kind of really get a feel for for how they're living and and you know and, and you and i've talked about this before troy but with like the bedding there's there's so many areas like that whether you're in the Appalachian Mountains or in the Rocky Mountains that these these bucks aren't aren't laying in the same bed all the time and they they have an area you know they have an area that they're that they're in and you know whether the wind or whatever it might be and I I, I do the same thing with looking at where their bedding areas are versus a, a particular bed for the most part yeah and with our mountain bucks. They have their summer bedding area based on conditions, feed, food sources, any type of stimulus that makes them happy, makes them work. Then they have a fall that they pivot to, and then they have a rut. And I've talked about this before. To be in the game, if you're going to hunt like I do and want to kill specific deer, I'm talking specific deer only, know them well, uh, old deer, I have to know where my bucks transition to and make new bedding areas at for the time of the rut because the breeder bucks do that. The bucks that are doing most of the breeding, they are calculated. They show up on certain doe family groups and they service those doe family groups from past history or attempting to service them in the past or now they're maybe they're the man or maybe they've been the man for a couple of years. And then they leave and they'll move out on you. The, the fortunate thing that I had going for me on this deer that I killed, he had grown up on my big scrape cluster. Now, I didn't build this scrape cluster. It was it was built by the deer. I've just overmarked it. But he grew up on it since he was young. He lived close. He always felt safe and comfortable near it bedding. And that's why I thought I had a great chance of killing him because I was in the game with him big time near his I mean, I had the keys, his beds, I had his bedding zone, great feed in there, big destination food a mile below me, uh, all the does in the world he could service or, or try to, and I'll tell you, when I killed him, he had no fat on him at all. He had been breeding like a mother. I mean, he'd been getting <laughs> after it. Uh, and I could see that on my camera intel that any mature doe that was coming in, he ran every mature buck out of my spot pretty much but one there was one that must have been a tough brave buck that that's a buck actually that walk at 30 yards that anybody would shoot in this country probably in the united states i let him walk because i want to kill this deer here um but he basically ran off five other stud bucks that had hit my scrape in the previous 15 days to when i started hunting him hard so 15 days prior to that i had like these scrapes are so incredible that I had what would be seven shooter bucks to anybody that's looking for an incredible buck. Now I want to kill a buck of a lifetime. And that's to me what this buck is for a mountain buck. Um, 
So I only had two in there that I would consider hunting. And the buck that I killed, as soon as he started getting on the does, I never saw that other buck again. So I think he ran him off. And remember last year, the buck that I killed broke his rack off. So if he broke his rack off, you know, he was a, he was a fighter and I got to watch him so much on video and in person before I killed him, I got to watch him that day. He just, he just had a demeanor about him that was like, I will kick your ass if you get near me, you know, that kind of deer. And that's what he always looked like on the videos. He'd walk in and everything just scatter. So he had that pin, he had that pin back ear demeanor always. So I thought he was in trouble and I felt like I was in the perfect location to get an archery shot at him. Uh, did, did he ruin my chances of shooting other deer? If I was just hunting deer, big bucks? Yes. But I didn't care because he's the only one I wanted to kill. Yeah. Yeah. He was just, it just from the sounds of it, just a mean son of a bitch. Like he, and, and you, he you was, well. <laughs> Well, you had well, to get rid know. of him. The other bucks I, are probably I, thanking you. He's on. It's you know how you get the bully buck that's got a crappy rack. Yep. This is the bully buck that you know one seventy plus. Yeah, <laughs> had a great rack. <laughs> yeah, and that doesn't always happen either. No. So you know he was. Yeah, he just had everything. I ever, you know, he's super unique and heavy. And I had two different guys look at his teeth and I had him at five and a half and they all said five and a half or six and a half. So he's five and a half all day. And I, I believed he was five and a half based on last year's Intel. I had a ton of video of him last year at four and a half. In my opinion, a lot of guys think he was five and a half last year. I don't, I think his teeth show five and a half, but yeah, I know he's five and a half or better. Well, and I, I just want to, I want to touch on something about the bully bucks with the crappy racks real quick. So the reason why I'm going to say this is before we got on this podcast, I was out hunting. I took the flintlock muzzle litter looking for a doe today. And I went into an area that I've, I haven't spent a whole lot of time in archery, but I know there's a bunch of does in there, but I always run cameras and learning and, and shed hunting. And I checked one of my cameras that I had on this scrape and I only had one like good mature buck there during the rut which was like it kind of blew my mind and he was this deer that <laughs> i had the sheds of from three years ago and he looks the same except otherwise yeah. other than he's just a tank of a body on him but he's got he's got about a 16 inch spike coming out one of his one side <laughs> with like some little abnormal points coming off the base and a little kicker coming off the base get giant spike and then a four yeah. on the other side and he's just he's an old deer but he's just a bully like i was watching him on the videos on my camera and he's just pushing there was a couple smaller bucks on that around that scrape and he's just running them off he had does there for multiple days just like just running every doe in the country around that scrape he'd come back through you know five six times in the night and then in the evening and the morning and daylight and just like that buck owned that area and he ran yeah. everything else out of there like and yes. the rubs that that deer is making you would think that there's a a 160 plus deer in there like he's making some giant rubs and everything and it's just it's hilarious and now that i know it's you know it's him again and and uh he's in there but he he actually had disappeared no i didn't run a camera there last year that, that's why but i hadn't i didn't even know he was still alive until i put a camera in there again this year and and saw him but that's that's uh your your buck was the the exception where you get a bully buck and he's got a big rack on him <laughs> yeah exactly he was he was the king of the area and he knew it and whoever he got into it last year must have been a war because even after he broke his rack he was running my scrapes more than any buck so it must Jeez. have been a war i'd like to know who he got into it with because this guy's got five and a half inch six oh not six he's got five and a half inch bases I and mean, last year he busted off when he was a good buck he's probably 155 last year um, but anyway, yeah, I, I had a lot going for me in the fact that he was very comfortable living where he'd been living for a couple of years. Um, all the does he ever needed in the world and he was still traveling. Other guys were getting him a long ways away, which is crazy. He's a big traveler, but he would come back during the day and bed real close to me. Um, I'd say between. I bet he, I bet he bedded 150, 200 yards from me a couple of days. Like the day I saw him at 54 yards, he might've only been bedded a hundred yards from me, 150. 
And then he probably bet it all the way up to three, 400 yards from me a couple days also. But again, it's no big deal for a white tail buck in this country to walk three, 400 yards to go check a scrape in the rut. They don't care. That's not a far walk. No. It's a piece of cake to them. Quarter mile, quarter mile to these deer on a trot is nothing. What? So when you're talking about like you felt like it was the right time going in on them, was it, were you basing that off of that historical knowledge for the most part? Or were you going in checking those cameras? Did you have, uh, I, I know for the most part you can't use cell cameras because of the, the right. service in there, but what, what was kind of, how'd you decide that like, you were going to really start hunting them at that point? Well, this year I, I bought some better, I bought some cell cams that got better service. So I was able to run a cell. Um, I was able, I ran three cameras in there, one cell overviewing everything. And then I have a video camera on the scrape. And then I have what I call my, just my extra camera to make sure I don't miss anything. And it's amazing. Three cameras versus two versus one is unbelievable. That extra camera I put way back caught bucks that I didn't have on the other two cameras. So I had this staged, uh, like I wanted to kill this deer. I wanted to know everything about him. I had it staged up and set up really good running three cams. The cell camera did work in there. There was a couple days with heavy storms. It wouldn't process anything, but then it would catch back up when the, when the clouds cleared out. And anyway, uh, be- between the historical data bow and just kind of the way the deer in this area use these scrapes up until easily up until December 10th, my ruts later than what most people experience. My breeding phase of my rut really doesn't even start till almost Thanksgiving. Okay. And there's enough does in the area to keep bucks busy until about December 10th. And then it, then it, then it dives off. And then we get a late, a real late early January type secondary rut for does that get missed Christmas to January 10th is kind of the secondary rut. So it was make, you know, my game plan was based on all those factors and the real time right now, Intel was incredible. I was able to really surgically pick my days and on the days that I hunted him, I I added it up again the other day. It was such a blur because I was trapped. My son's football team made it to the semifinals again this year, got beat out in the semis. We were traveling every weekend. So really what I believe I came up with was three two-hour sits and could have shot it at him in one of those and didn't, elected not to because I didn't like that range on this deer. I'll just be very frank. Last thing I want to do is wound a buck of a lifetime. I want him closer. So I, you know, I don't, I've killed so many whitetails that I don't push it. I don't need to a deer for anybody else but me and i did not out of respect or of a shot even though i can shoot that shot so i let him go so so two or three total two hour sits and then two all day sits and i killed him on the second all day sit so five total sits so it really wasn't a lot of sits no. and i had him twice i had him twice was able to kill him on the second all day sit and I think when I talked to Aaron on his podcast, I was thinking it was six or seven, but it wasn't. I went back and looked at it on my calendar and I was like, dang, you only hunted this deer five different sets. It just seemed like a lot because I was, you know, the only thing on my mind during that stretch was my son's football team, my work and trying to kill this deer. And I wasn't sleeping much <laughs> because I was doing all kinds of stuff to just be able to get to it, you know? Late night, I I literally scouted the whole month of November in the dark, checked my cameras in the dark. I I made it, I made it available for me to get down there because I would go in the dark and I would go check my cameras in the dark based on his behavior. He never, ever seemed to be around much after dark until about 10 at night. So I used that little window in the dark to check cameras, replace batteries prep scrapes, do whatever I needed to. So actual sits versus me being down there was definitely, I probably doubled the amount of time I was down there, Yeah, but I wasn't hunting him on it. I was just prepping or, or fixing the road, you know, or whatever I needed blowing through 
huge snow berms that the plows put up that would have kept most rigs from getting through a two, three, three foot snow berm to even get on the road. You know, just stuff like weird stuff like that you wouldn't think about. You know, getting out and shoveling them out with a shovel at eight o'clock at night and then staying, you know, and traveling home two hours, just stuff like that, you know, things like that. But anyway, I wanted to kill this deer and I knew what, what an awesome deer he was. So I feel like having two nice daylight visits from him and five sits bow is pretty decent on a buck of this caliber. Oh yeah. Especially in the mountains when you're, you know, you're not, you're not sitting over ag or anything. I'm not saying that that's any easier, but I'm saying it's different and you're not, you're not seeing that consistency normally, um, unless you're on top of that deer. Yeah. He was coming down and checking these scrapes every, I want to be, I want to be very accurate on this. He was never later than 36 hours on checking my scrapes when I would overmark them. And it was usually within 24 hours. What's the term overmarking? What what does that mean? So I go in and I overmark the scrape, meaning I, I, I feel it was, I clean it out and I was cleaning out. Like there was one night I cleaned out a foot of snow out of it and you got to clean scrapes out down to the dirt in the late season or the deer will abandon them. So I was cleaning these with stick, a big stick getting all the snow out of these big community scrapes. And I ended up only doing three of them instead of five of them. There's five of them there. And I would clean out three, his favorites that were on video that I have him on video, always addressing. And within 24 to 30, and sometimes it was 10 hours. Sometimes it was eight hours. One time it was three hours after I left, but he would come in beyond behind me after I overmarked him, cleaned him out, overmarked him with my scent, licking branch, urine, everything. And I was putting my mix in it, my multiple deer profile stuff. So I was throwing a lot of deer at him. Between three to four hours up to 36 hours, he always came back. I think the longest it took him was 36 hours on my camera until that, that, that I saw in my videos and that I saw in my cameras for him to show back up. And then he would overmark me. And when he would overmark me, this is no joke. I'd never seen a deer dig snow out like he would and dig the dirt like he would in the deep snow. So I felt like, and it reminds me of my six pack buck from the white tail addictions episode. That's a few years back that I had that deer would do the same thing. He would come in, clear the snow, get it to the dirt, throw dirt everywhere and, and then remark it. So overmarking is just me overmarking or remarking the deer gotcha. with my scent. Yeah. And I think that was crucial because even on the video when I shoot him and I filmed all this, he's angling down a trail right towards my scrapes. Now I shot him 35 yards from the scrapes because I wasn't letting him walk out of my life. And that's a whole nother story we can talk about because he had other deer around. But I made sure I got him killed. When he got to 35, he was a dead deer. Yeah. But he so was angling. He was taking the trail bow that goes directly to that hub of scrapes or that cluster of scrapes. So when you going back to you, you mentioned about the backtracking, um, yes, and that, the, I, yes. I wanted, I wanted you to touch base on what you did with this deer. Was that at night that you were doing the backtracking? Yeah. Or like, I'm how, at, how are you doing that? That's an awesome question. I'm glad you remembered to bring it up. This really helped me define exactly where he chose his favorite bedding zone. So what I did is when I initially started hunting him in there, um, early on and i can't remember the exact dates but we probably had about a foot of snow eight inches to a foot early on in there mid-november roughly and he had come in on my cameras and overmarked my scrapes after like the first hunt because every time i hunt when i leave i always overmark always on a big deer because i want that scent working on him while i'm gone he had come in, overmarked my scrapes, walked over by my tree, walked down on the path that I had pounded out, and he went all the way down to my truck on one of the very first times that, and I know it was him because his track was huge, and I had him on camera, so it just all added up. Well, he had walked all the way down my trail, all the way down to my truck, and I thought, <laughs> I thought, 
you dirty sucker, you come in and you bloodhound me the first time you come in after I start hunting you. So I changed up my game and I'm going to get to the backtracking in a sec, but it all plays into this. So I immediately, and I don't care what anybody thinks, I'm the one hunting this deer. I know how these mountain bucks are. I've had them do it before. He didn't just randomly walk down my trail, in my opinion. I don't believe that. His big track went all the way down to where my truck was. So I started parking another quarter mile back. And that fixed that because I started parking down to where I didn't think he'd want to walk that far down it that far. I walked an extra quarter mile. And then when I went back in there the second time in the dark, just to prep scrapes, check cameras and get out, it was not a hunt day. Um, and this was also based on Intel all the way back from October of when he was around and when he wouldn't be on, on a range of hours. He was rarely there from like seven to 10 o'clock at night ever. So I thought, okay, for whatever reason, it's not his time. He's doing other stuff. He's got does. He's chasing. He's bedding some, whatever. I didn't care. I just knew this was a zone or a, a range of hours. I hardly, I didn't see him at all. So I went in on that second trip and I backtracked him from the scrapes, from my site. I backtracked him up and I found his track on three different trails, either where he came down to me or exited. And then I also had his track below me on two different trails. So I had five different trails. I walked out every one of those one evening, probably a hundred yards. And what did that do for me, Bo? What did that tell me? You were trying to figure out as far as where he was betting at, living at, and then how he was accessing uh, the scrape. So you can kind of see where he would be coming from or going to. Yeah, and it gave me a really good indication because once I got up on one of the trails, then his trip. One of the specific trails that ended up being the trail I killed him on, it had more of his tracks in it meandering around up in there than any other spot. All I had to do was get 100 yards up in it. Then he was all over in there. Big beds. Uh, not just saying they were his, but not very far from my stand. It's kind of like, wow, they're right on top of me. Um, but it's real thick above me as soon as you get out of the little opening that I shot him in. Um, and I've no, I know how thick, I, I know how thick this is because I've shed hunted it for a decade and it's where we find some great shed. So it just made sense. It, his track was everywhere up that one trail. His track was more just distinctual and only on the trail on the other trails other than one other trail. So I had two really good trails. I liked that. I felt like one of them, he was probably spending 70% of his time betting and coming down slope and the other one this direction above me was probably a 30 percenter and then i felt like everything below me and beyond me and on my access in was more nighttime down checking on those that are in much more unsafe places for him to be if you will yep but i had tons of tracks and him walking around and meandering around in the snow above me and a lot in this one that went up to the would have been to the south uh it would have been to the west so you know the first time i hunt him on one of my two hour sits i get him right away and guess what trail he comes from up there and he's behind a doe so then i'm thinking well was it just the doe that pulled him through that trail or is that where he is too and you know that was all that's all up in the air still to this day i don't know but he was up there yep and then i end up and then i end up killing him from up there and those backtracks, I did it one more time, probably middle week after I saw him, probably three or four days later. I did it one more time after a hunt because I got down, I freshened the scrapes. It was a real dead evening I, and the barometer wasn't doing what I wanted it to. And I thought these deer are just hunkered down. It was snowing and sleeting and raining. And I thought perfect time to backtrack snow, sleet and rain on top of snow. Yep. And I knew, and I knew cold, cold weather was coming and I knew a lot of snow was coming and I knew everything was going to get covered up right away. My scent, everything. So I did backtrack one more time up that one trail and sure enough, he's in there. He was, he was up in there and he was, I found one bed that was, you know, just a tank of a bed, probably 150 yards up in there. So I probably pushed it to 150 that night. And then I just didn't need to see anymore after that because those tracks are just 
I don't know if anybody out there in this world backtracks much anymore, but it tells you everything. Yep. It's incredible. And it was right now. It was right now evidence because we were getting snow bow every other day or every third day. And this was all fresh. So, yeah, I just felt like, okay, the season is going to end on the 15th. You're going to take the last three days off. You got a super cold front coming in. You got a foot of, foot of snow coming between those days, total foot of snow max. It's just going to be, you're going to get him. You're going to get, you're going to see him. And that's what ended up happening. It's, I took the right days and I killed him on the second day I took off. What, what day was that that you killed him? Uh, the, if, it is, if Tuesday is the 13th, it was Tuesday. Okay. If it's the 13th, I killed him two days before the season was over. December 13th. Yeah. If that's Tuesday. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. I I took those days off. I I took Tuesday, Wednesday. Oh, I take it back though. I, I misspoke and I didn't mean to, I had Sunday off and hunted all day after my son's football game. I busted ass back Saturday night and hunted all day Sunday. So I was thinking that as a day I took off, but I didn't. So I hunted him Sunday, nothing. I gave him Monday off, gave him a break. I took Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday off to kill him. So I killed him on the first day of my three-day vacation. That's what it was. Ha, okay, nice. First first day that I took off on purpose to try to kill him. What what time of the day did you end up killing him? Exactly. It was 4, 4 o'clock to 4.02 p.m. Okay, yep, in the evening there. Yeah, afternoon. He was He was never... He was never predictable in a daylight movement. He never came in one time on the same time in the daylight ever. Interesting. And you, yeah. you know, you know, you know, what's funny about, about that, what you're saying is like when I've, when I've seen like in, in our area of the mountain bucks, like where <laughs> there he is, um, <laughs> we'll have you show him in a second here. But I, the, when I've seen bucks that were like, that would hit us, uh, like say a certain time, like say come through a scrape in daylight. It typically had to do when there was a destination food source. Like for example, like for example, if there was an Oak flat that was dropping and that's where they were going to, you know, maybe that he's coming back to bed, you know, and there was cold weather and he'd come through right, you know, right first thing in the morning or last light. But I feel like when, and I'd like to hear your opinion on this cause you'd know better than me, but like, I feel like when you're like in their bedding zone, it's just kind of whenever they feel like getting up sometimes and, and going down and checking them. And like, that's yeah. that to me, you that's, that. I mean, everything that you said there, obviously you were in his, you were in his area, his core area mm-hmm. that he felt yes. safe and he yep. was moving. Like that's, you know, like the, I I've seen bucks that if I feel like I'm in where they live at, they'll just, they'll come and they'll hit those scrapes and there's no, there's no predictability to it as far as what time. Sometimes it'll be in the middle of the day. You know, it's just right. they get up and want to, you know, maybe they got some snow on their back and they've been, you know, laying there all day. They want to get up and browse a little bit, go down, check their scrape yep. and go back and, and lay Bo, down. And Bo, you're exactly right. You nailed it. And that's why I hunt so many full days when I can. Yep. Because I don't position myself on a deer outside of his like if he's going to, if I'm going to hunt a mature stud veteran, old mountain buck, that's beat everybody else, beating the rifle hunters, everybody. If I'm not in his zone or his, his area of, I call it his hideout, especially that time of the season. If I'm not in it, I'm not in the game with him at all. I'll never, I'll, I'll get lucky to be straight shit house luck. If I killed him, I knew with this deer that I was like, you said, because of the random, non-patternable, non-predictable daylight visits that he was making, it was 100% because I was so close to him. And I was in an area he felt very comfortable. I have talked about that for years. I don't know if people really understand what we're saying there. It's extremely hard to get in there, infiltrate it, and hunt it more than once without screwing it up, especially if you're making a bunch of noise every day. That's why I have a stand that's preset. That's why I'm sitting on those scrapes. I guarantee you anybody tries hunting this deer where I hunted him and tries to hang and hunt every day and how quiet it was on the day I killed him. You'd never see him. Yeah, no, that, that totally makes sense. And I know like, and especially when you're talking about, you know, that he's laying there right above you, 
I mean, and right where bumps. you're, and especially where you're at when it's that cold and it's everything is so silent, and silent. you know it's, it's it's so silent getting in. Like you have to you have to be as quiet as possible to get in, and you gotta when you're sitting there, you yes. gotta be quiet. You can't have you know your stand popping and making noises, and yes. you can't be you know brushing your boots off on the stand and snow dropping no. and all that stuff. So true, and it's just a it's the ball game that I know works and it works on the biggest and best bucks in my area, my oldest bucks. Um, yeah, I, I set 10 hours that day and I was dead silent all day. I barely moved. I mean, I, I wanted to kill him so bad. I, I did not want to regret me making a mistake. So I set 10 hours that day. I do a lot of meditating in a tree. I do a lot of closing my eyes and just listening. I, I believe it or not, I do a lot of praying. Um, and I just, I just really chill. Like I'm very comfortable and I'm not fidgety. I had one deer come in all day till three 30, but I just felt like we had a pressure system coming. We had snow coming at 4 AM in the morning. It just felt right. I just, it really felt I like that's this dude. If he, if he's betting near me, he's going to be here before dark because he hasn't been around all day. And I got really confident at about two thirty, three o'clock because he had made one and two thirty visits before. And when I didn't catch him moving in that window and nothing else moved at three 30, the woods, the woods literally just freaking woke up in there at three 30. Three little young bucks that were looked like they were lost, <laughs> <Come for strolling through. laughs> and I was telling Aaron this the other day. So don't want try try not to be too redundant. And then an old doe that lives in there that I absolutely can't stand showed up, and she just a bee. <laughs> <laughs> and I I had I had the perfect soft southwest wind right across my face. They're above me. They're all coming from upslope. I knew I was in the money. Then a second doe shows up working her way down. And this is a big area I can see because all the snow had actually got blown off the trees. So I could see like an extra 50 yards. And then right behind that second doe, I saw, I just saw this big body, long legs, tall, long, big deer walking through the trees way up above me, far way up above me on the mountainside. And I saw him drop his head and I saw his rack and I was like, all right, there he is. And he was on, he was on the, the two trails I talked about before that I went up and that had the most sign on it. He was on the one that had about 70% of the sign coming down it. Yeah. And I knew he was in trouble because it led right that I want to on this screen here, that trail led down the mountain across my face and my scrapes are over here to my right. And I'm sitting here like this. So he came he angled at a 45 right down in front of me. Okay. And then, okay. So now, now explain kind of the, the, the moment of truth, like the, the shot process time. You said you had to shoot him at 35 yards, correct? Yeah. And I, I probably could have shot him closer, but I'll explain my, I'll explain what happened. He, when he, when he started descending down the mountain on that trail of death, that's what I call it. I'd killed three bucks off of it. Um, <laughs> over the years, when he started coming down it, I had the best, uh, diversion in the world. I had deer closer to me working their way down by me and over by the scrapes. And they all looked up the mountain and saw him and they all changed their whole attitude. Even the, even the old grumpy doe changed her attitude when she saw him. And they literally, as soon as he come out into the open on the hillside, walking down towards him. They all put all their attention up the mountain to him, and then they all just kind of naturally just kind of got off the trail, like step back, because here he come. And he he come walking down that mountain like king of the woods, no care in the world. He had a quartering wind across his nose that came down past me and quartered me and dropped my scent right in that draw I was telling you about off to my right side. Yep. And it that draw where my tree is, is 15 yards below my big scrape cluster. So it's money. All my scent was just dragging down or was just pulling down into that draw. 
I knew he was in trouble. Now, the wind current was really slow. But it was late enough in the evening, Bo, that the thermals were helping me, too. So I had this southwest plus a thermal pull. So it almost pulled the wind off my shoulder and then right behind me. So it was it was just unbelievable. Yeah. And he has a quarter. He's got a wind quartering into his nose. So he was he was all the deer were fine with it. I was sitting in the tree you had to be in to make it work. And then the location was perfect for that scenario. And I have this probably four foot pine. I mean, a giant pine that is 30 yards from me. And I always use it as a gauge because it's 30 yards from my stand. And it has this huge limb hanging off of it, if you will. And what I do is when they come off these two high trails, I wait for those bucks eyes to get behind that huge limb. And that limb is a, a pine tree has multiple branches off of it. So it's like a shield for me. So as soon as, as soon as that buck, as soon as that buck got his eyes behind that shield, I didn't worry about any of the other deer. I was totally just watching him and I was hoping they, none of them were looking at me. I'm 30 feet up, but again, I got a steep hill in front of me. So it looks like I'm right across from him. And I drew I drew sitting down right when his eyes went behind that limb and that limb's huge. And it's got a lot of, it's got a lot of foliage on it. It's a big pine tree anyway. So I'm at full drop. It all went perfect. My bow is deadly silent. Thank you, Jake Kramer. And it made it happen because you could hear a pin drop in there when I drew that bow and the deer were walking in the snow and making enough noise to cover some noise but I didn't make any noise. It was dead side. It was, I was quiet, got full draw, wearing the Sitka. I mean, quietest stuff out there for the cold. It was 20 degrees, probably, probably 18 or 20 when I drew on him because it was 22 during the day. So it was probably in the teens. I've been sitting 10 hours. And when I drew, I was just very like comfortable in what he was going to do. And sure enough, he came down under that limb. And he had a deer on both sides of him and they got off the trail <laughs> and they're just kind of looking at him. And he, he just turned to a little buck to his left, which opened up his, he turned and opened up his uh, lungs to me. And a couple things went through my mind really fast. Shoot him here. Cause he, he stopped and he just yeah. stared at that young buck. And he had no idea I was around. No, no deer. The deer did not know I was there. Yep. And I'm at full and I'm thinking, that's a nice shot. It is 35. I, did, I didn't think 30. I, I knew it was 35 yards because the tree is 30. So I know I was going to shoot him with my second pin and probably center punch it with my second pin, which is 30 yard pin because he's going to drop. So I'll, I'll center punch him at that distance. And I usually don't shoot any farther than that ever on anything. And then I thought, the thought did cross my mind, should you just hold full draw and let him walk down towards the scrapes? Because the trail he was on led right down to the scrapes. And that thought went through my mind just super quick. And I thought, no, I'm going to kill him. So I, as soon as I t thought kill him, I settled my second pin dead center of his lungs because I knew my second pin was 30. And he was 35. But I also knew he's going to drop some at that distance before you hit him. Yep. So I, I center punched him. Um, you'll see it on video. My, I'm steady as heck. No, no shaking. Not oh, nervous man. at all. I just want to get I can't killed. wait to see that video. <laughs> and, and it's, you know, hey, it's, it's, it's a long ways away, but at least I got it all on video. You can see it. And they'll zoom yep. it and, you know, even make it yep. better for me. But you see it and you hear it. And I touched it off. And, you know, I don't even remember, I don't even remember, I never remember touching them off. I always just, it's just, everything goes into autopilot for me. Yep. It, and all of a sudden the arrow's in flight. You know, that pin settled where I wanted it. I, I let it, I always let it settle and stop. And then I touch and I hear that arrow go off and I just hear, <laughs> I mean, the best sound in the world to a bow hunter. And he just does the, I've seen it so many times, the hurt run. He freaking just turns and digs like a cutting horse and goes straight up the mountain, hard as he can run. 
Yeah. <laughs> and I did on the video, flip the camera. I, I list, I watched him go. All the deer ran off. The, the crazy doe starts blowing. Of course. Yeah. She didn't like what happened. And I'm just totally in tune with this deer. I watched him and then he goes out of sight and then I just start listening and I just sit there and I'm just listening and she's blowing already. And I'm like, Shh, you know, be quiet so I can hear him go down. Cause I felt like I just smoked him. Yeah. Based on, and, and bow, I do not have lighted knocks on my bow yet. I'm going to now that Idaho finally, uh, finally legal. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and I was hunting in Washington, but, if you put you legal, don't change you put, I don't want to change. Yeah. So yeah. now I'm going to put them on for, for the years to come. I have to put them on now just because it would have been, it would have showed me right where my arrow hit. Yep. At 35 yards, not so easy to see where your arrow hits if you don't have lighted knocks. No. So anyway, he's out of sight. The old doe starts cranking up. The, she's blowing and I'm like, shut up so I can hear this deer. I'm thinking that and I'm real calm and quiet. I'm just listening. And I don't know exactly how many seconds or minutes it was, but I heard a deer go down. And it was up the second trail, the 30% trail, that I heard a deer go down up in the timber far. And I heard it go down. And I know what I'm listening to. I've heard him before. And I'm like, he's dead. Thinking he is dead. That was him. No way that wasn't him. And this was, in my mind, probably up there 100 yards max. But wait, 50 yards out of sight. So... It's four o'clock. There's another half hour of daylight left. Uh, of course, I text Jess and Ty and my wife right away. And I said, I just, I, all I said was, I, sh I just shot HR. And then they start. Yeah. <laughs> and Tyson's over, you know, he's finishing up college. And well, he was, and he was getting ready for a semifinal playoff game. He's like, dad no way send me pictures i'll get all those texts send me pictures send me pictures like i'm still in the tree so i always wait a half hour i don't care i always do i wait a half hour and i knew i had a half hour till dark so i got out right before dark i walk over to my arrow i walk it off it's 35 36 long steps so it was right what i thought 35 yards roughly um and i look at my arrow and it's not right like what the hell i just smoked this deer in my arrow hardly has any blood on it at all and it's, there's a bunch of brown stuff all over in the snow. Brown. Smell it. Does not smell like guts at all. Smells way different than anything I've ever smelled. I'm like, what in the hell, you know? Did I make a bad shot? Did I shoot him back? So I get on the phone with Ty's, tell him what I'm seeing. And Jess, I got them both on. Ty's like, Dad, don't you dare push that deer. You must have hit him back. You know, we just, and this is good education for the listeners when we yeah. get to the end of this. We we all played it very cautious on this kind of deer. I mean, this is a deer I do not want to push. I do not want the wolves or the, or the coyotes to find him and eat him. I don't want to, you know, something to kill it or to, I don't want to push him. And I've been in this ball game before. So I thought I was kind of pissed at myself. Cause I thought I made the great, I thought I made a great shot. I really did in my heart. thought it was perfect where, and the arrow's not perfect, but listeners, I promise you sometimes the arrow doesn't come out where it's supposed to. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> uh, we play it super safe. I go up the two trails of death, 50 yards only on each side, no blood. I only go 50 yards. I do not want to push this deer. I heard him go down 100 yards up there, and I believed that. But I thought if he laid down or fell down, and if I gut shot him, he's going to get up and run a half a mile or run, you know, run 300 yards on me, and I don't want that. So I only went 50 yards. And it was dark by then, and I'm shining my headlamp and a light, and I'm, like, looking for a deer laying up there on the mountainside in the snow. I can't see anything. So the powers to be, some of my best friends across the country, I got a hold of a couple. Billy down in Oklahoma has probably recovered more deer than anybody. And uh, I said, you know, I sent him the video. I actually backed out, went out to my son's place is an hour away, my oldest son, Jess got everybody on the phone that I trust wholeheartedly and showed Jeb the video of me shooting. Me. He goes, Troy, that's a dead deer. He goes, your arrow diverted. He goes, you smoked him. I guarantee you that arrow came out funny and arrows can divert. They can hit a rib. They can move around. And I'm thought, I'm thinking, man, Jeb, that, that seems right. And I hope you're right. 
but I'm still going to play it safe. So it's going to snow at 4 a.m., Bo. So we all go to bed on purpose and get up at 1. It's, it's my son, Grayson Gregory, his best friend who lives with him. We're out, I'm out at their place because it's closer than my house to this deer. They, they're they both like, yeah, Dad, we're, we're going to find this deer with you. So they, we all go to bed really early. I couldn't sleep. They did. I actually did get to sleep by about 10. And we got up at 1 o'clock because – it took an hour to get to the deer, and then we knew we had two hour window before it started snowing to find this deer. And we and my my reasoning was if I don't find him in two hours, Bo, then I may not find him at all. Yeah. I thought I'd find him in two hours because I didn't push him. You know what I mean? Yep. So we get out there, just totally set up with big headlamps and flashlights. And the first thing we do is we go up and we check the trail that it looked like he got on and ran out of sight on, which was not where I heard him. And I told the boys that I said, it's not where I heard him go down, but I want to go check this trail. Cause on video, it looks like he might've jumped over to that trail up in the timber. So we do this big grid out through it and his tracks are everywhere up there. Just like I'd said before, his track is everywhere. No blood. We go out about a 300 yards and, I, and we're like, we got to turn around. And Jess says, dad, the wind is switched and I smelled him. I go, what? He goes, dad, I just smelled your deer. And he goes, look what the wind's doing coming back from that direction on that first trail. You said you heard him. I'm like, all right, let's all head back. He's not out here. There's no blood out here. So I had two guys with me. We get back to the original trail, the trail that I thought I heard him on go up and die. And, and I am my, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, I know that's the ace in my, my pocket because that's where I think he is, but there was no blood Bo. So we went and did the first trail based on the video evidence of where we thought he might have ran based on what we could see on the video we went and did it first getting it up to, to scratch it off the list yep so we go back to the second trail and we're gridding back across to that second trail and as soon as i got to the trail guess what i see in the trail and i was 20 yards above where i turned around you see the, the blood deer laying there. oh blood okay <laughs> no blood yeah close close bow blood <laughs> everywhere so he ran I walked up about 50. He ran about 60 to 70, probably about 65 yards. There was blood everywhere in the trail. Then it was just a red carpet. I look at the blood. I say, Jess, Grayson, blood, and we got him. And the reason I said we got him is I know what that kind of blood means. I mean, it was a red carpet. Yeah. So it took him, oh, it took him running straight uphill, steep, chest cavity. Yep. If you think about where the blood is in his body, and when I get to the exit and entrance in a little bit, it'll all make sense. He had plugged up his exit. So he had to build up enough blood to blow out his end. If that makes sense. Yep. I know exactly and, what you're talking about. Well, I look up the I look up I look up the trail and it's steep. I mean, it's straight up. It's really steep. And Grayson says, Troy, there he is. Guess where he was laying? Right Back where up. I heard him go down. Oh, right. Okay. So you right did right where I heard him go down huh. to a two. Yep. Oh my gosh. And, and Red so carpet. what did it look like as far as the exit when did the arrow deflect in there then? Yeah. So it's a red carpet bow all the way to him. 20 more yards, max, maybe 15, 20 yards. I mean, it's just a red sheet of blood. He went up there and just piled up and died. Just like what I heard from the tree stick. He got out of sight got out of my vision, ran another 30 to 40 yards out of my sight, which I could probably see 50 yards up the hill. And he piled up and what I heard go down was him. We get up there. He's laying on his exit side and it's back here. It's back. And I'm like, what in the hell? So I flip him over because there's blood everywhere on his entrance. I hit him perfect on his entrance. I was one inch high, one inch higher than dead center. So it smoked his lung. But for whatever reason, and, and I'll get to that, I always do the gutless method on all my animals. Yep. I'm a gutless guy, take all the meat off, cape them, do all that. Um, what, for whatever reason, that arrow went in, I think it, I'm thinking it hit a rib and turned and then shot out the back. And when it shot out the back bow, this is interesting, it cleaned the arrow off. Cleaned the arrow off. And my really good buddy, that's my bow guy, Jake, he was at the house that night checking my arrow before we went out to find him. Jake would actually went and help me find him, but he was had a job interview that morning, so he couldn't go. 
But anyway, Jake used to work at a hide and fur shop for years. Jake smelled my arrow and goes, Troy, that's bile. He goes, that's bile all over your arrow. He goes, I've smelled it a million times doing gallbladders. So anyway, it all came, it all made sense after I got to the deer. That arrow went in perfect, turned, shot out the backside way back. Somehow the arrow turned because I picked my arrow up and it was perfectly intact and it was covered with that brown and a little bit of blood. And that deer was dead in 30 seconds, Bo. <laughs> and so, all right. And what what were you, were you using um, an expandable or a fixed blade head? Can't shoot expandables in Idaho or I don't know oh, how to change yeah. this year. I forgot I was about that. The, I was shooting that kudu head this year, that kudu. With the, okay. with the cutters. Yep. With the little gotcha. cutters on. Oh, it tore him up. It put him down, but it did not leave. It definitely, the arrow threw me off. And you don't want to play that evidence wrong. What if you walk up and bump no. him and you did hit him in the guts? No. So and it, I, 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 we, played it, we played it right. Well, yeah. And, and Even I was, though really, he was dead. The reason why I was asking that is because I I've seen deflections with expandables before with ribs and stuff, and with a, a fixed blade, not as much. But obviously, that's <laughs> that's 100 percent possible as it as it did happen. But and I I I agree. I tend to play it safe unless I know like it's a muscle type wound, um, and that I need to or a one lung and I need to push them, you know, to, to get another opportunity. It's like, I, I feel like unless you got the weather, I mean, we did that with my dad's buck. Uh, I guess it was last year, that big one that he shot, he wasn't sure. Yep. And he ended up making a perfect shot. The deer was only 80 yards there dead, but you know, he wasn't sure. And there was hair you could see from the tree yep. and, and whatever. And so we waited until there was snow coming in and we went in right before that snow, uh, to, to go in and check. And I, I just feel like unless there's, you know, heavy weather coming in or, or whatever reason, it's better to just wait. You know, my buck this year, when I shot him, I, um, I was 90, well, I definitely heard him fall, but I heard coughing. And then what I thought was him falling over and he was just in the thick hemlock trees that I couldn't see, but I still, I sat in that tree for 45 minutes until it got dark. And then I was yep. going back out to the truck until my dad came. But my curiosity at, at that point, I was like, I know I heard him. So I just, when I get down to the base of my tree, I just got up on this little knoll with my headlamp and he was laying right there. But I, I just, yep. I don't know. I, I agree with your, your playing it safe mindset. Cause I think there's too many times that, that people push them, get impatient and it's just not, not worth it for the most part. Yeah, I agree. And it was, you know, sitting down 35 yard shots, a long shot sitting down 30 feet yeah. up and everything came in. I'm like, I always do. I'm always a, what if guy, what if I did hit him back, then you got to play it smart. Mm -hmm. You know, and the arrow gave me all the evidence in the world that I did. Um, my buddy, like I said, Jeb out of Oklahoma said, no, that deer's dead. He goes, he said, you'll find him within a hundred yards of where you shot him. Or if the coyotes bumped him up, he'll probably be dead about 250 yards away because he's dead and he's dead quick. <laughs> 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 he was right. He was, yeah. he was less than a hundred yards from where I shot him. Oh my gosh. That's, that's awesome. And then, so then at that point you guys cut them up and packed them out. Uh, that, how, what's your method as far as getting them out with the gutless method? Do you carry like a frame pack or? Good question. Uh, we did all the white tail addiction media in the dark in there, uh, brought mm -hmm. extra lamps. So Grayson was the light guy. <laughs> my son is, my son, Jess is really good with filming. He's very artistic. So he shot all the interviews and all that. We did that. And then it started snowing pretty hard, which was kind of cool because at 4 a.m. it started snowing real hard. And that's in the video, you know, the recovery video. Yeah. And then on our initial ascent up in there to find him that night, I, I pulled my sled in. Ah, I have a calf, okay. like a birthing calf sled, a big sled for calves, yep. for cattle. I pulled my sled in and my trail, my trails pounded in there deep enough, Bo, that the sled kind of just set in the trail and came up behind me like in a track. And it's, it was so steep in there that that trail ended up really helping us get him out because that sled wanted to take off on us big time a few times. <laughs> I like I had, to hold, I had to hold that sucker back and I'll send you a picture of him in the sled. It's a pretty cool picture, but that's a big deer. He was over 200 pounds easy. 
and I'm holding sled, but pulling him out with that sled was nice. So, Bo, we shot all the media in the dark that we needed to. And by about 4.30, I think we got out of there. And the sleigh ride down the mountain, down my trail with that buck in, it was fun. A couple times, Jess had to help hold on to him with me because it was steep. And we got him out of there all the way down my trail. And then having the 21-year-old boys with me to lift him in the pickup was nice because I didn't even have to lift him. So we we took him out whole. Okay, We didn't even gut him up in there. Bo, that's one of my spots that the last thing I want hanging out in there is a bunch of predators, even after I kill. So I always take my bucks away from my really good scrapes. I never gut them near them. I drag them. I don't care how hard it is. I get them out. Um, And that's just, that, that's just my opinion with uh, alpha predators that I have. Yeah. yeah, Um, You're dealing with a little bit different stuff than, than most people are for, first of all. And and two, the sled, the sled method is, is, especially as snow. Like, I feel like that's such a underutilized thing. Like I've, I've used it before in gun season. Cause that's typically when we have the, the snow as far as using the sled. But I remember I ran into a guy, I was backpack hunting in a spot in, in Pennsylvania. I don't know, four years ago or so. And there was a bunch of snow and ran into this guy way back in. And, and, uh, he was kind of surprised to, to see it, me and my buddy back in there. And he's like, Oh, he's like, I've been hunting here for, you know, 20 years. And I said, how do you get him out? You know, cause we had frame packs. I noticed he didn't, he had a little roll up sled that he carried with him, um, that he used. And he's like, when there's snow, you know, it's, it's, it's a, you know, a decent method, especially if you have a trail or something that you're able to pull yep. it out on, but going downhill, I could just picture, I could just picture you sitting on the back there and looking like Santa Claus coming down off that hill with, <laughs> with, <laughs> with that big buck that'd on the been, front. <laughs> that'd have been a train wreck. I'd have hit yep. a tree. Yeah. <laughs> what I do, Bo, is is I bone everything out that I pack up the mountain. So a lot of a lot of my spots I'm real high and dropping down off a ridge and hunting. So I bone all those deer out and pack them straight up on a pack frame. But anytime I'm ascending up to a tree stand, I have my sled with me when there's snow. If that makes you know, that yeah. that's a good that's a good comp or that's a good uh it's a good way to get them out the probably the fastest both ways. And I always bone them out though. If I got to pack them uphill, do you, do you typically, do you carry a, like a pack frame uh, or a, a frame pack in like while you're yep. hunting or is that something just you go, you leave it the truck and you go for recovery? Another great question. It depends on how far my hike is in. Yep. So I've got that internal pack frame that I take in with me on downhill tree stands that's a long ways and I don't want to have to hike all the way back to my truck to get a pack frame. If it's not that far of a hike back to my truck, sometimes I'll leave it and just go in and hunt, come back and get it if I kill. Uh, and then again, anything above me that I have to hike up to I, in the snow, a sled's the best getting them out. Yeah, that, that makes a whole lot of sense. And that's the same thing with, with what I do as far as I don't always take a pack frame in with me, especially if it's like, okay, I can, if I need to, I can process it, take a quarter and throw it over my shoulder, carry it yes. out and then go get yep. the, and then go get the, the pack frame at the truck and come get the rest of it or whatever. And that's, that's cause yep. the only thing I've found about most like meat hauling packs, they're so big. They have a big profile on the tree. They're kind of loud as you're going a little, they squeak with the frame. They are. And, they and make noise or pain. Yep. Yeah. And I, I'm I, right so with I run you, the Bo. Same th- I run in the same same thing. And I've went back and forth. I used to carry a pack frame all the time. And then I was just like, it's it's just kind of a little bit over to kill for most of the situations. But if I'm going way yep. back in, sometimes I will. Um, yep. it, it it all depends. I, I agree with you there. And it's funny, you're talking about the silence uh, thing there. When you called me, I think it was during the summer when you were calling me about, you were looking at, uh, one of the piece, I think it was sick as ambient jacket. And you're like, you were like, Hey, all right, Bo, is this quiet? And you're like, and you know, my quiet. And I'm like, yeah, I know you're quiet, Troy. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and we were going back with it. Cause you were talking like when, uh, sick did the fanatic update there a few years ago, you were like, yep. man, this is, this is it. Like, cause you need silent yep. and where you're at. It's like similar to anybody that listened to the podcast I did with Jim hole up in Alberta, like where you're hunting is similar. It's, I mean, you're basically in Canada anyways, but like, it's just quiet and you need to have quiet yep. gear. You need to pay attention to it, you know, gear yourself, everything. Yep. I had my sick of bibs on. I always wear a real quiet 
like Under Armour sweatshirt like this. And then I wear my Sitka vest over it. I really like the vest and I try to always make the vest work even when it's bitter cold because when you draw, all your noise is right here and here. Yep. And when you got that vest and you have super like the quietest material on outside of it, and I'll do layers. I do the Sitka Marina wool under this. Yep. But I always have some type of poly real quiet. I, I do wear some under armor, under la- base layers too. And it's because they're so quiet. Yep. And I'm a hood guy. You know, I'm always flipping my hood on when I'm in a stand over my stocking hat. It just, it's, it's a comfort thing for me and I've always done it. So for me, I drew on that deer, no noise at all. None with my arms, none with the, none with the sick. Uh, I mean, it was just, it's the reason why I was able to kill him and for him to be so at ease. And people that end up watching the video on white tail addictions will see that I, that deer didn't even know I drew. And it was I can't dead quiet wait to see that. that. You're gonna yeah. you're gonna have to send me a teaser of it, like a, a video of it on your phone or something, so I can take a look at it ahead of time. I want to see that. Yeah, you you can just tell by his demeanor he has no clue, zero. Yeah. And if you don't take all those steps on these mountain bucks, I'm not saying other deer aren't more tolerant. I'm not saying that other deer won't tolerate more, but these deer won't. That doe, that doe that was in there is a straight crackhead. If she would have heard me. <laughs> move a foot. I did not move my feet. I mean, Bo, all I did was my bow. Oh, by the way, I had my bow on my knee for almost 30 minutes, almost 30 minutes. And the video proves that I did a 13 plus minute video and a 14 and, and I had paused it in between when I killed him. So there's almost 30 minutes of video there. And I'm literally the only thing I did one time is reached up with my finger and touched my button for my camera. That was it to pause it once. So anyway, I filmed that and that, you know, I was sitting there for almost 30 minutes and you know what it's like to sit there for 30 minutes like this and not move. So for 30 minutes, my only movement was a finger and then a draw and a slight turn. I mean, I might've turned that much right there. (laughs) Pick up, pick up that rack, pick up that rack and show the, the camera screen here for anybody that's watching the video version. It won't even fit in the screen. Holy cow. <laughs> I love that deer. And then yeah, a great big brows. four point on this there. Yeah. Oh. And then the brows. I don't know if you can see them. Yeah. I can see them clear as day. Yeah. Oh man. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's his, just such a massive deer. And what you, you said, he's what? Only 14 inches inside spread and he yeah. still scored over 170. Yeah, he, we knew he was 60s. And when I talked to Aaron, I don't know if you listen to that podcast, but Aaron talked to me about him. We had not put a tape on him when I talked to Aaron. And I was just, I was just adding him up by looking at him as sheds, you know, break, breaking it down. Like if I pick that shed up, I have a pretty good idea how many inches it'd be. Yeah. Well, he, he was, he was 13 and six eighths inside. Huh. And he's 80 six plus on the left side and his right side 71 plus so he's right at 172 171 and a half to 170 i had three different people score him i scored him the lowest at 170 and like six at 171 and change the other two guys that scored him are really good they scored him at 172 and change gross yeah and that's all that counts anyways but uh yeah we're, that's... we're, we're all within an inch all three yeah. of us and i went real conservative on where i started my measurements yeah and and that's just that's just such a massive deer and especially with a spread that's that small to score that high that just gives you an idea of <laughs> look at those main beams bro they almost touch they're an inch apart if you measure them the the, <laughs> the camera makes it look wider than it is if you go yeah. from here down to there, it's an inch and like an eighth. Um, They're close. Man, he, he was protected. He'd fight anything, and nobody could even get in to get in close on him. Oh, yeah, man. and it real really good mass for this country. Really good mass. I don't yeah. know if you can see it. Oh yeah, I can see it clear as day. That's that's a real heavy nice block mass. right there. And that cheater is almost ten inches in there. That that inline. Yeah. The inline. Which really helped his which really helped his gross. Now he's he's a neat buck. I don't think I'll ever kill a deer that narrow again that can gross over 170. No. 
No, that's that's incredible. No, I, I I was I was so pumped when you sent me that message when right after you killed him there. I was like, you got to be kidding me because I know how hard you were working at it and you were set on. I mean, you'd sent me pictures of that deer, you know, leading up to it and and everything. And I was just I was excited. And I didn't realize that was in Washington until uh, I don't know. It was after I think it was after. you. Oh, when, actually, it was just the other day when you we we're talking about going after another deer but the snow was too deep but then i was like oh i didn't realize that uh i thought you were just that was in idaho for some reason my idaho buck's a bigger buck and i sent you pictures of him he's a bit he is a bigger deer than this deer and this deer is awesome that idaho i wasn't, buck, I wasn't gonna say it because i didn't know if it was but uh, yeah he's no, it's okay <laughs> that, that, that idaho buck bow is is obviously you know i'm praying he makes the winner and yeah. i think he will I think based on where he lives and where he can migrate to, I believe he'll make the winter. But he's probably the best deer I've had in Idaho since 2003 when I killed my 185. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, he's, he's, he's awesome. And trust me, any other year than this year since 2008 or nine, the snow would have allowed me to hunt him. But this year has been insane. We haven't had this bad of a snow winter since – it was either eight or nine that we had so much snow early. And that's what happened to me this year, Bo, is we got all of our snow really early, a ton of it. Yeah, so it just, that's... You, that's why you don't just have one buck in your pocket. No. You know, got to have, you got to have options. So many dudes got a hold of me this year in said, Troy, struck out, don't have anything. I don't ever say anything negative back to them, but man, you got to have some options uh, when you live in this kind of country is my point. You better have two, you better have some low elevation options, some high elevation, some migratory options. You got to have some options to go to, or you end up just, you know, you end up working so hard all year and, and spending a bunch of money, and then you don't even get to go hunt because you can't get in, or you or what? you don't have the right equipment, or you don't have the right equipment. Bo, that's important too. The vehicular equipment is yeah. is huge in this country. That's why I have snowmobiles uh, side by side. Uh, a mountain bike, a, uh, e-bike, everything you can think of. I got all the tools. Yeah, it's a big investment, but this is what makes me happier than anything on the planet, pretty much, other than watching my boy play ball or, you know, being with, watch my son at a bass tournament. This is, this is kind of like my Super Bowl, doing, you know, hunting these deer. Well, and, you know, Troy, and I, I – there was at one point, I remember when people were asking, they're like, oh, you know, you, you spend so much time out there. I don't have that, you know, that time and everything to put in like they were saying to me. And, I, and uh, you know, when I talk about when I'm, you know, scouting in the spring and I'm putting on like my goals at least 200 miles every spring as far as hiking around and like, I don't have that right. time. And it's like for a while I felt like almost bad about, you know, like saying, yeah, I have that and they don't. But at the same time, it's like there's a lot of sacrifices that we had to make, you know, to, to do that. And not, and that's not putting down anybody else, but like, there's no shortcuts there's, you know, and anything that you can do to help yourself, whether it's tools, whether it's gear, whether it's time, like that's what's separating, you know, there's, there is no shortcuts. You can't, you know, if you, you, to, to being able to do it. Yeah. You were limited on time to hunt, you know, this year, but your knowledge up until this point and learning in the scouting that you were putting in a non hunting hours was able to lead you to have this opportunity. And I think that's, you know, that, that separates, that separates people. And like, you know, we, we talked about, uh, in, in depth on the last time we did the podcast about like, you know, setting yourself up monetarily, you know, where you're like, yeah, that you have some toys that help you get in these places that you bought with cash and that you worked your butt off for to, to be able to have. And that's, you made that a priority and, and that's, that's the way it is. Yep. I had to make a big shift when I was your age, I was doing the hundreds of miles, all the scouting, uh, freshly married, no kids yet when I was young and I was, and I, and, and I thought of this, even when I was young, you better go learn this stuff now because as soon as you guys have kids, and I'm thinking of myself here, as soon as I just, as soon as we settle and we and we knew we wanted to have kids and we knew that life was going to get extremely busy. So, well, how old are you, Bo? Thirty. Yeah. Prime of your life. Any guy out there listening, you're 30 years old. You're in the prime of your life. You better be putting some time in because things will change as you get older. Some of your time probably will be you know, devoted 
usually, I mean, I'm just saying generally guys that are 30, you get settled down. Time yep. starts going to other entities in your life that are really important to you. And when Tyson, you know, signed to go play college football, I mean, I'm no dummy. I, I thought, boy, you're not going to miss his games. So you better figure something out fast. And you bigger and you and, and so what I made sure I did right before he got went to college and even in his first year of college is I just made sure I had every T cross and every I dotted that I could when it came to the right equipment for me to be super efficient. Um, I work a ton in the summers just because of the nature of the way this world is and everybody's moving there. And I have a great summer gig that I, that's my own gig. So I'm not going to turn that down, Bo, because that's stuff that helps my whole family. But I also made sure to invest in, you know, really quality time scouting when I could, making sure that I made, played my cards right, made good decisions on days off, because I am limited right now. Now, the truth is, I got to do this for three more years. Ty's got three more years of college football. And then we'll see what ends up with what happens to him in football after that. But I feel like I made a lot of great strides this year from last year dealing with that new equation for me with the college football equation. My wife and I are never home on the weekends. We, we literally are watching our son play football. I mean, we've got people that we have people that stay at our house to watch our dogs for us. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's just what we do. Uh, we have, we have dog sitters and people that stay, but, but back to what you're saying and back to what I'm getting at here is, and you got to play your cards right and you got to be smart about your time and efficient and get the most out of your time. And if that means you got to go scout like I did at my age, which I do not care. I love doing this kind of stuff, doing stuff that people don't think you'll do. If you got to go scout, scout or set something up or fix something or change something or adjust something to kill a deer at 10 o'clock at night, then go do it. Who says you, who says you can't do that? You know, I probably do things unconventionally as much as anyone because if I don't get it done, I'm not even getting into my animals because of the snow this year. Just stuff like that. So, yeah, uh, it was a very, very fulfilling season based on the limited amount of time I had. And I truly believe if I wouldn't have had this much snow, which I normally don't this early, I might have been sitting here with two, two, my, two of my number ones because I was getting that other deer figured out until the big snows came. I, I was on him. Well, I I think um I think if he makes it through the winter, I I think he's in trouble coming into coming into next year. <laughs> That's for sure. I mean, obviously things with predators and all that can change yep. everything as you've went through. I you told yep. me many times where that's thrown thrown things off, but I think uh that just gives you another another target next year as far as keep, yeah. keeping after him. And I won't get it emotionally attached. I mean, he he's incredible. But, but I'll make sure, because of what you just said, Bo, that there's one or two other options, too, and I'll work on it. Like, I literally am just – I'm looking out the window right now, and we, our, our snow went from two and a half feet deep in the yard to about six inches in three days because all it's doing is raining. It was 45 degrees here today and raining all day. So you know what I got on my mind? I'm ready. I don't have to go back to work till 13th. Or till 13th. I'm literally going to spend, I'll probably get 50 to 80 hours in of scouting time starting. Ty and I are starting tomorrow. We're going tomorrow because Ty's home. Ty, my son that's a football player gets to be home till the, he's home till like the 16th. So yep. we're, we already got a, plan, a trip planned tomorrow to go see if there's any sheds on the ground. And we're going to go do a bunch of backtracking and pull cameras and Hey, we're already going like, Game on for next year, right already, which is yep. you know, the season just closed the season just closed on the twenty fourth out of here. So yeah, I l cannot wait to get out in the woods tomorrow and go for a hike. Heck yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm the same way with the, our late season. Like I have doe tags that I'd, I'd like to get at least one more deer for the freezer, but I'm also strategically doing it in areas that I want to hunt bucks. And as I'm going and I'm trying to track these deer, cause we have snow still, but it's, it's starting to, uh, 
I guess it's going to be melting later this week as we start getting those temperatures coming across the country. You know, today it was, I don't know, it was like 12 degrees this morning when I was out, but it's up to like 37 as a high today. And then it's just continually getting warmer as you go through the week. And I'm like tracking so, so valuable and learning from those tracks and finding tracks and backtracking like you're saying and all that stuff. And it's just, it's good to, to be able to get out and, and be able to check it for the next year. And, and when you, when you said, you know, about how important it is to have multiple bucks to go after out there because of weather and predators and all that stuff, it's the same thing here with like, and even just looking at hunting pressure. I mean, one thing I dealt with a buck, I was sending you a bunch of photos of the last few years I was after, I could not pin him down this year to save my life there was a bunch of other people in there they were logging they were cha- things were changing yep. and i had i i i still i went hard looking for him and hunting him and eventually i had to be like i need to i need to move and i had places to go because you know i have backup things to be able to do and now i'm i'm not in the same shoes as you as far as where I'm not just one deer, nothing, but typically what I do is I'll hunt one deer and then shoot something else that I'm happy with. And that's where I'm at in my hunting, you know, career at that yep. point. But if I was just hunting that deer or that spot, like that area, then I, I probably wouldn't have filled a tag, you know, and he did, he did end up showing back up the last day of the, our archery season and daylight. I was hunting in West Virginia and I got a self cell cam picture of him <laughs> last day of the season rated right at first light hitting one of my scrapes and and i actually i told my dad this i said i said i knew i was going to be gone that week hunting down there i said and i'd already filled my tag anyways but i said if i was going to kill that deer i still think i can kill him that that from november 14th to the 18th in that period here which is like late rut but that that deer loved over the last three years of learning him moving at that time. And he always worked this one scrape during that period in daylight, never knew when it was going to be, but it was going to be in that period. And that's what he did. Right. But, uh, and he and did it he again. Ended, yep. And then he ended up getting killed the second day of gun season. Uh, unfortunately, but the way I look at that is, is like, all right, I don't have to worry about him anymore. It's time to move on. I got other ones I've been watching and it's just shifting over to something else, you know, and that's kind of the way you got, got to look at it, I guess. Yeah, I think that's a great mindset. It's if you're gonna, you know, guys that want to target certain deer or even, you know, maybe three or four specific deer, try not to get too emotionally hung up on it because if you do, it'll wreck you sometimes. And yeah. one thing I do, Bo, uh, I do have a last two or three day rule. Um, my backup bucks, which are great bucks, they're fair game the last two or three days of a season. If my target buck doesn't seem like I'm going to be able to kill him, if he's not killable, then I will shift. And I've done that over the years. Uh, The reason it was all or nothing on this deer here is because he was so killable. He was, he was not, he was not giving me any indication that he had any idea that I was hunting him there. Yep. No, that, that, that totally makes sense. So, no. so again, another, another game time, actual in the moment decision versus a, versus a blanket decision, you know? Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I like it. And I'm, I'm just excited to start figuring them out, you know, for next year and, and getting after yeah. it. I mean, this is, this is my favorite time. I mean, mostly I, I, I used to not even spend a whole lot of time during the winter when there was snow on the ground. Cause I was like, ah, I can't see the scrapes as well. I can't, you know, see a lot of the sign, but then I just lo- looked at it differently. It was like, okay, uh, I, I can now I can learn from tracks and I can learn from this. Like there's, 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 you can learn no matter what time of the year it is. So it's just like figuring out when you have the time and making it, making it worthwhile and and I don't know, I think a lot of it's just that perspective of what you're looking for and what you can learn from. Yeah, my probably one of my greatest educators over the last 30 years has been snow and backtracking. It taught me so much when I was your age. Um, I would literally, when the season would get over, get on a big track. And I'd backtrack him all day just to see right after the season where he was hiding out, where he was bedding. Taught me so much about how those mountain bucks move with the winds and the thermals too. Yeah. Like if you just, if you take the time not to just walk the tracks, but walk them. And as you're walking them, 
break down everything that's going on around you, the security cover, the scrapes that you come across that he addresses, or at least walk in the snow late, any bed, elevation changes, where he's, you know, laying down for the day. I mean, that kind of stuff is so valuable in the big picture of understanding mountain whitetails. And that didn't come easy. You, I did, I used to just hike and I still hike a ton. Uh, but man, I used to hike like a madman before children and family and sports and all that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. No, but hey, both three more years and I'm free to do whatever I want every day of the year. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Three more years. Three That's years it. left. Three more years <laughs> left to teach it. And then Mr. Pottinger is going to live in the woods and try to be a lot better deer hunter than I am now. Wait a second. So, okay. When you said three years earlier, I thought you were just talking about Tyson's football, but that's also when yes. you're retiring from teaching. Yeah. When Ty's after Ty's senior, Ty's senior year is my last year of teaching. Yes. Holy cow. I, I'm, I'm concerned for the, the deer in, <laughs> in Northern <laughs> Idaho and Washington. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Then, then I'll be able to hunt Montana more just because I would hunt more States bow close, but I don't have the time. Yeah, yeah, dog, and, totally and, understand. And the time that I want to dedicate to a deer, I got to have some time. So because I'm so close to Washington, it's just easier. And Montana, you do have to draw, but it's not real hard. I yeah. used to scout Montana quite a bit until my time got real small. And now, yeah, three years from now, I'll be three states again, full bore, and try to draw probably every year in Montana as long as I have a killable or a buck that I like. Yeah. Oh, man, that's awesome. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm excited for you. That's for sure. And, uh, yeah, just gotta, gotta wait it out the next three years and, and, and make the most of your time. And then it's, uh, back to having fun and getting to walk everything. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, I'm not complaining. I'm having a blast with my son and his football. Yeah. It's really cool. It's awesome. It's so no. cool. And he's chomping at the bit. Like he lives vicariously through me right now. Cause he can't hunt. He doesn't have time. Yeah. Oh, I can, I can imagine. I can, I can imagine where, like, because I'm sure he's very much like you with the whitetail thing. He probably didn't have a choice growing up, um, but he he's uh, once he's out of college and every out done with football, he'll get to spend more time in the woods and getting after it just like his dad. Just like both my boys, my oldest is the bass guy. He yep. treats bass just like I treat whitetails. Tyson's unique that he's the youngest. He loves the bass. And he loves the whitetails and he'll wreck them both when he's done with college. Like he'll get after them both. He, he followed his big brother and his father loves them both. And Jess kind of, Oh, Jess is a good whitetail hunter. Trust me. He does great. Yeah. But he doesn't Jess doesn't want to spend as much time on whitetails as we do. He rifle hunts and kills a deer every year and does great. And he loves to eat them and he really respects what we do with the deer, but he applies the same mentality to big bass. And yep. bass fishing. Yep. Oh, I think that's awesome. And and it, it doesn't really matter whether it's white tails, whether it's elk, whether it's bass or anything outside of it. It's just when someone has yeah. that mentality to work really hard for something, I just have a ton of respect for that. Well, and it's healthy. It's a great yeah. it's a great natural high versus doing what a lot of people do in the world to pass time. Yep. I I Netflix bar or whatever it whatever it yeah. is that's <laughs> no no thanks you know it's it's who wants to go through life as that being your best memories you know that kind yep. of stuff I totally well i was going to tell you too but before we get off i i had my big bull biggest bull i've hunted in years through full draw three times this year and could not get a shot through the brush <laughs> oh oh man i i uh well was it was it you i was talking to and and uh i think it, I don't know if it was you or not, but I was, I was not complaining, but I was talking about my frustrations when I was hunting in Montana, where I had missed a bull going through the brush and where I hit a branch and it deflected complete clean miss. And then I made a bad shot with another one where it deflected at 18 yards. I hit off some brush and I was so frustrated. I was a full draw another like six times in my three weeks out there and couldn't get a shot through this stuff. And then you're like, yep. yeah, well come to, come to the country. I'm hunting it. Or no, I was talking to Josh Boyd, Northwest Montana, but similar type yeah. country. And, uh, he sends me a video of like where he's hunting elk. I'm like, holy cow. All right. I'm done complaining. But so yeah. yeah I, and I, we're, <laughs> where Josh hunts, 
<laughs> where Josh hunts, it's exactly like this habitat. Yeah. <laughs> North, Northwest Montana is the same as Northern Idaho. It's the yeah. same stuff. Yeah. yeah so I get what Josh is saying. So yeah, we all, <laughs> we all kind of, I, I, I thought you and I would both have a pretty nice bull on the wall this year and it just didn't work out. I yeah. full draw three times, three times, three different days could not get him shot. One of the times he was broadside and in an opening, but I could not get his dozen cows to clear him <sighs> until it got dark. Like I had cows in front of him the whole time where I was, where I was yeah. pinned down and in full, where I was a pin down and full draw. All I needed was the cows to move and I yeah. had him and I got, and I literally sit there while I was full draw for a long time. And I finally put it down and then I just waited till dark. Not one time did they give me an open shot because they were all feed, they were all feeding out in front of him. Oh, that's yeah, frustrating. Just, just, and he was he was twenty five yards, and the cows were as close as ten yards to me, and I was on the downwind <laughs> side of all of them. It was just crazy, just stuff like that that you just think, yeah, sooner or later there's going to be a gap, and you're going to get a shot. And nicest bull I've hunted in years too. So hopefully really? I get back on him. Yeah, hopefully he's. He's been showing up on this group of cows every year for the last three. And this year I hunted him hard because he's really nice, big six by six. And hopefully he'll be back next year because he's done it three years in a row now where he shows up on this group. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> that's, anyway. That's, that's awesome. But yes, sir. all right, Troy. Well, I'll let you go. Thank you again for coming on. There's a the last look of that giant deer for anyone watching the video again. Um, Troy, where, where can people, where do you want to send people again to, uh, to be able to check out your stuff and then the video once it comes out, uh, check out whitetail addictions, TV people for our hunts. They'll be out in the spring. And then me personally, uh, Instagram's the best. My Facebook is full and it's MTN underscore man, mountain man, 33. Awesome. Thanks again, Troy. You've been on the podcast probably eight or nine times since I think you might be the top guest that I've had over the last wow. four and a half, almost five years that that uh, we've been talking. And uh, you're also one of the most requested. So I appreciate your time and coming on. I always enjoy it. Well, thanks, Bo. I appreciate it. That's quite an honor to be on your show so much. And I'm glad we've built this good friendship. We just need to get together and hunt someday. I know. And I, I want to know your dates whenever you do your, your camp. And if I can make one of them, I want to come out and, and spend some time learning from you scouting. So whenever those, gonna, whenever you get that figured out, I'd love to check it out. Yeah. For your listeners, I'll put it on Instagram. I'm going to try to do three, one day, all inclusive boot camps this year, two in Idaho, probably one in Montana. So I'll get that stuff out later this year. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. I, and, I, I definitely, I'm a, a big proponent of going to those things and learning from it. And, and, uh, obviously I had, have, have my own camp there and, and, yep. uh, and that's why I think there's so much value in that and learning from people. So I'll be looking forward to seeing when that, that comes out and hopefully I can make the trip out there and, uh, and get to, if nothing else, get to spend some time with you and learn some whitetails. Yeah. Is your brother in Montana, Bo? Yes, he is, but he's uh he's actually moving back to Pennsylvania uh this spring. So he's coming gotcha. back to coming back to PA. But he's in Montana now. I was just thinking kill two birds with one stone if you come out. Uh I'll I don't I really don't need a uh, huge reason to try to come out west when I can. It's just <laughs> as long as it aligns right with on, the schedule. <laughs> All right. Well All thank right, you both. So, yep, thanks, Troy. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.